what I love is you take all these, that's what I love about physics in general, you take all this complexity and you think about, well, what are the basic elements here? How can I model people? Well, let's forget about the emotions. Let's forget about the biochemistry. Let's forget about all that. Let's just think about them as a particle that interacts with other particles. And what can we get out of that? And what they get out of that is that, in these circumstances at least, humans behave like gas molecules. Stupid, dumb gas molecules. So that's, whatever way you look at it, that's a pretty neat result. Yes, I've got a paper called, with the, just the absolutely wonderful title of Collective Motion of Moshers at Heavy Metal Concerts. It is indeed a physics paper, and I've just found out from Jesse, who's the first um, author on the paper, so a few minutes ago by email I found out that it's actually been accepted in uh, a very, very good physics journal called physics, Physical Review Letters. Um, so it's great to see metal appearing in these type of journals. It's great to see those links between metal and physics being forged. I'm a huge, huge heavy metal fan. I think you could do an entire, at least one module, maybe two modules on the physics of heavy metal. Um, particularly with regard to the uncertainty principle, things called Fourier transforms, signal of processing, um, the links between the sound of a metal guitar and what the waveforms look like and there's a very, very intrinsic and real link, I'm not making this up, there's a real link between the sound of a heavy metal guitar and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this is just a wonderful paper, well what they've done is they've analysed the behaviour of um, moshers, um, sorry, I'll, I guess I'll explain what moshers are first of all. So if you go to a heavy metal concert, um, one thing that happens a lot is that there tends to be a lot of let's say physicality. There's a lot of people moving around, there's a lot of people bumping into each other. Um, you get a lot of what's called moshing with people moving around doing motions like this, running into each other. You also get things called circle pits where huge motions of people run counterclockwise. It's a fascinating problem in terms of the dynamics of human beings and there's increasingly a lot of work on taking humans and instead of treating all that complex biology, reducing them to that reducing them to a particle that moves around, that can um, trace a particular trajectory. You look at its velocity, you look at how it interacts with other particles. And crowd dynamics is a very, very, coming an increasingly important aspect of physics. Um, and of course it's really, really um, uh, important when it comes to the, the dynamics of how crowds move. You said people can be treated as particles. Particles haven't got minds. You can't talk to a particle and ask it to stop. Particles don't care about hurting other particles. How can you treat people Indeed, like particles? Indeed, but you can model all of that. You can model all those type of interactions. So even for pedestrians, if you have pedestrians walking down the street, there tends to be a sort of exclusion zone, your personal space around you that other people don't want to invade. So what you can do is model that as a sphere of influence, basically. You can even model uh, the, the sort of tendency for people to flock together as a flocking force. You can build that into the equations and you can model this entire system. And in many cases, the parallels with fluid dynamics are striking, particularly in terms of bottlenecks and jamming and um, when it comes to traffic flow as, as well, queues in supermarkets, all these type of things. Remarkably, you can reduce to, to very simple at one level physics and very complicated at many other level physics. So what this paper do has done is it's a very, very neat idea. And it's not, I don't find it surprising at all that it's made its way into physical review letters. What they've done is they've, the one difficulty is you want to look at the interactions of people, particularly if you're concerned about the safety of people and the safety of buildings and how um, you, you might be able to engineer a building or change the architecture or change the way that people move around the building. You, you really need to focus on how those people are streaming or how they're moving. And in many cases, People tend to move in a non-panicked, relatively sedate fashion, but not at a metal gig. At a metal gig, there's an awful lot of um, adrenaline, there's a lot of, an awful lot of people running around. So that gives you insights into the physics happening under those type of, yeah, there's no other word for it, extreme circumstances. And that's what they've done. It's a great idea. It also helps that they're both very big metal fans, of course. Um, and they've modeled it, and what they find, it's, so neat is that um, in marsh pits where people are doing this this motion where they're moving around, maybe I ought to stand up, um, uh, they find that you can model that exactly as you model an ideal gas. 
uh, in terms of molecules bumping into each other, um, repulsive interactions, no real attractive interactions because the last thing you want to do in a metal gig is get too close to somebody um, unless you're going to push them. What they find is that the, I don't want to get too much into graphs, etc., but this is just a fantastic result, is that when you look at the, velo the distribution of the velocities of people, and you look at the range of different velocities that people have and plot that out as a graph, it's what's called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. It's exactly, exactly the same mathematically as the um, distribution of speed you get in a gas. They got lots and lots of YouTube videos and just sat down and analysed those, wrote some software to analyse those and looked at the motion of people and then did loads and loads of statistics. And um, just, it's so neat. It's really, really, really cool way of, of, of doing research. So, because you're looking at humans under pretty extreme circumstances at a metal gig, the great thing about this is that you're getting a different environment than anybody's ever really looked at before. And that allows you to think about, well, safety. Or how do you um, really look at the monitor this situation, think about how you would get people out of a building, how you would... Um, like in a disaster. In a disaster, yeah. So, or if, you know, in terms of, you know, a football stadium, if there's a huge rush for an exit, um, how do you get people out? And is the best way actually to sort of have lanes of people? Or what way do those lanes of people go? Which route do they follow through the building? Um, to what extent are people going to sort of follow the leader? How can you break that up if that's a problem? How do you avoid bottlenecks? All of these type of things. What's great with this is that it's looking under, it's looking at those problems in the context of very extreme human interaction. A mosh pit does strike me as a very different environment to humans in an emergency where they're trying to attain a goal and there's safety involved. Whereas in a mosh pit, it's almost like there are no objectives other than to just be kind of chaotic and anarchy. So, I mean, it doesn't, it seems different. I don't, I'm surprised it's applicable. So, there's something called mosh pits where it's exactly that. You've got very random motion, but you also have something called circle pits, where it's a huge swell, a huge collective motion of people running around in circles. Interestingly, almost exclusively in one direction, which is something they allude to in the paper, which they don't really understand, which I find fascinating. Um, so in huge circles, and um, then you've got collective dynamics, then you've got to th th think about, well, who really is the leader? Who, who instigates this? Who, how does this nucleate? How does this type of, well, how do you get a phase transition from a mosh pit to a circle pit? How does that happen? Um, because that is telling you an awful lot about collective dynamics, which I think, I'll choose my words with care, but I think there's no reason to expect that you won't be able to port that type of idea across to rather less extreme circumstances. I despise mosh pits. My wife, girlfriend at the time, damn near got her teeth kicked out by mosh pits. Um, I think this is a, a great investigation. I think the physics is, is really solid and robust. Um, it's a really interesting problem, but I really hate mosh pits. Um, I, I know that's not going to do me any favours and win me any fans in the metal fraternity. I'll stress again, I'm a huge metal fan. I'm a huge fan of bands like Slayer and Meshuggah and Fe Fear Factory. Very, very hard-edged metal you know, hardcore metal, um, and it pisses me off, if I'm allowed to say that, maybe De Brady can bleep it out, but it really irritates me that I can't go to a gig where I've paid my hard-earned bloody money and watch the band without having to continually do this as a pit opens up in front of me. Um, it's, it's always been a frustration, and this is not because I'm some old, middle-aged, grumpy old git now. Even in my 20s, I despised it. Similarly with... Um, uh, crowd surfing, it just irritates me. And quite a few of the bands I really like, um, bands like, for example, slightly less metal, but bands like Pearl Jam and also the Mars Volta, a band called Consolidated, they actually said, right, we're not going to have moshing. I've, you know, I don't think you can argue with the fact that people have died because of marsh pits. So in Dublin in the mid-90s, shortly after I, I, I left Dublin to come to Nottingham, a girl died at a Smashing Pumpkins gig. And, you know, that's just ridiculous.